Hello and welcome everyone to this video podcast for evolution and diversity. In this video podcast, we're going to talk about interpreting phylogenetic trees. In previous podcasts, we've had several objectives to cover it. And in this one, really, what I need to do is define some terms for you. And some of these will be terms we've already talked about. So some of this will be review. And then we're going to take those terms and then use those terms as we apply phylogenetics to determine evolutionary relationships. So let's go ahead and get started with some of these terms. I want to begin with a definition of the term systematics. Systematics is the discipline of biology that characterizes and classifies the relationships among all organisms on Earth. Okay, now that I've given you a definition of systematics, someone who is interested in systematics is going to be interested in phylogeny. And let me remind you what a phylogeny is. And this is the evolutionary history of a group of organisms. This group of organisms we're going to call taxa. And that's the plural form. The singular form is taxon. Taxa or taxon simply refers to any organism that is in a classification scheme. So someone who is studying phylogeny is interested in the evolutionary relationship, say, between taxon A, taxon B, and taxon C. They want to know how these three organisms, or taxa in this case, how they're related to each other from an evolutionary history perspective. And to understand that relationship, they will often build a phylogenetic tree. And a phylogenetic tree is the graphic summary of a phylogenetic history. And we've talked before, and we'll talk more about how we build this tree, but let's just draw it for now. So the phylogenetic tree that I just drew here helps explain how taxon A is related to taxon B and how A is related to C and how B is related to C. And what we want to do now is talk a little bit more about that relationship. But before we do that, I want to talk about what kind of phylogenetic tree this is. It's similar to what we've drawn before, but we haven't really talked about its name. And you should know that there are many different types of phylogenetic trees. This particular one is based upon a term that we're going to call cladistics. And cladistics is a method for determining phylogenies by identifying shared by identifying shared derived characters among taxa. So for instance, taxon A and taxon B, they're going to share certain characteristics different than taxon C. And so for building a phylogenetic tree in this manner, we say we're using cladistics. Because we're using cladistics, the name of this type of phylogenetic tree makes sense. It's called a cladogram. And a cladogram is nothing more than a phylogenetic tree that is built using cladistics. Okay, I'm going to use this general cladogram that I've drawn here to point out some important features. Some of them we've talked about before, and some of them will be new. So the first term I want to point out to you is the term that we call a root. The root is the common ancestor of the species in the tree. So this root represents a common ancestor for all the different taxa. The next term I want to point out is the term tip. And we have a tip here, a tip here, and a tip here. The tip represents the descendant taxa, that is the taxon that has descended from this common ancestor. And in this case, often these tips represent species, but we're just calling them the general term taxon for right now. The next term I want to point out is the term called a node. A node represents the common ancestor of those descendants. So this node here is the common ancestor of taxon A and taxon B. It is not the common ancestor 
of taxon C. This node here is the common ancestor of taxon A, taxon B, and taxon C. And then the last term I want to point out to you on this whiteboard for right now is the term branch. A branch is any one of these vertical lines. And these vertical lines represent this population through time. The time from this point here to the tip. So I'm going to use this figure here to talk about a few other terms. And one of these is a term we call sister groups. Sister groups are descendant taxa that split from the same node. So for instance, taxon A and B are a sister group. They're a sister group because they both descended from this same node. A and C are not sister groups. B and C are not sister groups. But A and B are sister groups. So how would we describe taxon C in relation to A and B here? We would say it is an outgroup. An outgroup is a taxon that diverged prior to the taxa that are the focus of the study. So again, the focus of the study, let's say, is taxon A and B, the sister groups. Any other taxon that is not part of the sister group would be called the outgroup, like taxon C. OK, I'm moving to this figure here to talk about this next topic of resolving branching orders. The goal is to end up with a phylogenetic tree, like you see here on the far right, where there are only two branches from any given node. So we would call this one on the right a fully resolved phylogeny. And we say it's fully resolved, again, because we see two descendant branch points for each node. And we call this a bifurcation. A bifurcation is just, as I've said before here, a node that has two descendant branches. In the other extreme, on the far left, this is a completely unresolved phylogeny. And you see this because there are no nodes that only have two branch points. In fact, there is only one node, and every single branch extends from this one node. When this happens, we call this a polytomy, or sometimes we call it a multifurcation. A polytomy, or multifurcation, is when you have one node with three or more descendant branches. And that's what we see here. We see more than three, but we see at least three. As you can see, the polygenetic tree here on the left tells us a lot less about the evolutionary history of the taxa A through E compared to the phylogenetic tree on the right, which tells us a lot more evolutionary history about each of the taxa. Our goal is to go from a phylogenetic tree like this on the left to a phylogenetic tree like this one on the right. That's the goal. And so not surprisingly, the one in the middle is a partially resolved phylogeny. It does have this one bifurcation, so it's, that's why we say it's partially resolved. But we still have this one polytomy where you have one node with three different branches. OK, so now let's think about how we're going to apply phylogenies to understand evolutionary relationships. So I drew this different phylogenetic tree here. And to remind you, what we're looking at here is a phylogenetic tree with a, one common ancestor that gives rise to four different taxa. We see nodes here and here. And we see various branches. It's important as we look at these trees and study these trees that time proceeds from the root to the tip. So let's write that down here. Time proceeds from the root to the tip. The evolutionary time from this common ancestor to these taxa, the root to the tip, that is the evolutionary time that we're looking at. Do not read a phylogenetic tree going from 1, 2, 3, and 4. This shows the end products. It doesn't show the progression. Progression, the time progression, goes from roots to tips. So I also want you to know this other concept when we're applying phylogenies to identify evolutionary relationships. And that is that nodes are freely 
rotatable. So the two phylogenetic trees I show here with moss, fern, pine, and rose, and then fern, pine, rose, and moss are the exact same thing. Each one of these nodes can be spun around. So all we did here was we took this node here and we spun it. And so now moss is on this side of the terms as opposed to being the first one. Remember, it doesn't matter because the evolutionary time we're measuring is from the root to the tip. How they appear up here in a linear manner doesn't really matter. As long as the only way we changed it was by rotating the node. So think of this node as on this axis that can just spin around and around. We could have also spun the node at the, at the node that derived pine and rose. So let's go ahead and do that. Still have fern here, but we flipped rose and pine. And that's okay. We haven't changed anything about the evolutionary relationship between these species. We've just spun the node right here, turned it around. Doesn't matter the order on the top here, because that's not how evolutionary history is measured. It's measured from the root to the tip. Okay. And one other thing I want to point out to you is we apply phylogenies to identify evolutionary relationships. And I've said this before, but I want to make sure it was clear, because I, I don't know if I explicitly said it. So in this very simple tree here, we have our common ancestor here. And we have our two taxa here, A and B. And remind you that the node represents a speciation event. It is at this time in evolutionary history that this common ancestor underwent a speciation event to ultimately give rise to taxon A and taxon B. All right, so now I want to add to what we've already learned with this slightly more complicated phylogenetic tree. Again, remember we have our time going from roots to tips. We have our common ancestor here. We have one, two, three, four different nodes. Each of these nodes is responsible for a speciation event. And so let's think about which taxa share a common ancestor. So let's look at this first node. This was the first speciation event. And this speciation event represents the common ancestor of taxa A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, so now let's think about this node here at number two. Remember, this is also another speciation event. So this is the common ancestor of everything that follows from this node. So number two is the common ancestor to taxa C, D, and E. And I'm going to skip three for now and do four because we're close to it here. So this common ancestor at node four here is the common ancestor for C and D. And likewise over here, this other common ancestor, this other node at number three here is the common ancestor for taxa A and B. You should feel comfortable looking at a phylogenetic tree like this and telling me which taxa share which common ancestor. So while I have this drawn here, I want to go over one other concept. And we've talked about this before, but it's a good opportunity to review this, this concept. And so let me write it down here. Species that share a more recent common ancestor are more closely related than species with a more distant common ancestor. So for instance, since C and D here share a recent common ancestor at number four here, they are more closely related to each other than either one of them are to E. Even though taxa C, D, and E share a common ancestor, but that common ancestor is more distant. So again, C and D are more closely related because they share this common ancestor more recently than they share a common ancestor with E. C, D, and E are more closely related to each other than they are to A and B because they share a more recent common ancestor than they do with A and B. You should also be comfortable looking at a graph like this and explaining which taxa are more closely related to each other compared to other taxa. And we might as well take advantage of this phylogenetic tree to talk about one more concept. This phylogenetic tree does not mean a is less than B, is less than C, is less than D, is less than E. Likewise, it also doesn't mean that A is greater than B, 
and B is greater than C, and that C is greater than D, and D is greater than E. Sometimes when we look at a phylogenetic tree, particularly when we start seeing organisms up here, and we have these preconceived ideas of what is more advanced and what is less advanced, we sometimes want to say that there is some hierarchy to the position of these taxa, and there's not. Each one of these evolved independently. A and E evolved in a different set of circumstances, different types of environment, different types of evolutionary pressures, and so they are going to be different. They are different species. It doesn't mean that A is better than E, or that E is better than A, or is more evolved than A or B. It just means that they evolved differently. And that could be said with any five of these. They are who they are, so to speak, because of the evolutionary pressures that they experienced that the other taxa did not experience. Now, I just told you that the taxa at the ends of each of these tips are there because they had different evolutionary pressures, and that's why they are different species. And as I said, it does not imply that one is, is better than another. It doesn't mean one is more highly evolved or more evolved. It just means they're different. And so let's put some terms here that we might be more familiar with and see where some misconceptions come from. So let's put our good friend here, the gorilla. And over here, let's put chimpanzees. I'm just gonna put chimps with no disrespect to chimpanzees. And here, I'm going to put bonobos, my favorite primate. And here, I'm gonna put humans, which you probably have heard of. Now, often, you will see this representation, and it's such a horrible misconception. I'm not even gonna show the picture of it, but you know what I'm talking about, where, where they show chimpanzee slowly evolving and becoming a human, right? That is completely wrong. That is not what's happening at all. A better way to describe that is to say that humans, chimpanzees, and bonobos, they share a common ancestor here. Using some of the points we just talked about, we would say that chimps and bonobos have a common ancestor here and are more related to each other than a human. We wouldn't say that chimps or bonobos Either one of them are more like humans. We would say that they both share a common ancestor at this node. We would say that chimps and bonobos are more closely related to humans than they are to gorillas because gorillas share a common ancestor with all three of these here. And finally, it would be incorrect to say that humans are more evolved than chimps or bonobos or gorillas. They are just differently evolved. They had different evolutionary pressures placed on them, and so they evolved into different species. So next time you see one of those pictures or you see someone telling you that humans evolved from chimpanzees, make sure you correct them in a, in a very polite way, because we want to make friends and not enemies, but explain to them that humans did not evolve from chimpanzees. Chimpanzees and humans shared a common ancestor, and they evolved differently. Okay, let's move on to this next topic, and, and that is that a cladogram, such as drawn here with the blue lines, should reflect taxonomic classification schemes. That means that when we look at a cladogram, we should be able to make groupings around certain taxa, as we see here. For instance, we could put all of these taxa in one large group of vertebrates. They all have vertebrae. We then could make another classification scheme for mammals. All of them, except the turtle, is a mammal. So they all have hair. Then we could draw another classification scheme around the wolf, the leopard, and the domestic cat, but not around the horse. And that is because these three have carnivorous teeth. They eat meat, whereas the horse does not. Even if you get the horse really angry, it won't do that. Finally, you can draw another classification scheme around the leopard and the domestic cat because they have retractable claws. That is something they have that a wolf does not have. So what makes a leopard different than a domestic cat? Well, a lot of things make it different, but according to, to this um, cladogram, cats have the ability to purr, and sadly, leopards have spots, but they cannot purr. Now, it's important to remember that these taxonomic classification schemes were developed a very long time ago, long before phylogenetic trees were developed. Sometimes a phylogenetic tree does not fit perfectly well with a traditional taxonomic classification scheme. However, when the classification does match the phylogeny, so let's just write that here, classification matches phylogeny, we say we have a 
monophyletic group. We've talked about monophyletic groups before when we were talking about the phylogenetic species concept. But now I want to use this term in the same way, but, but to describe whether or not a classification matches a phylogeny, like it does here. These classifications fit nicely with what we see here on this phylogenetic tree. So leopard and cat would make a monophyletic group. Wolf, leopard, and cat would make a monophyletic group, a different one. A horse, wolf, leopard, and domestic cat would make a different monophyletic group, and all of them would make even a different monophyletic group. Now when we find that a classification doesn't match phylogenies, then we go back and we reassess the taxonomic classification scheme. Because maybe with this new data from the phylogenetic tree, we can have a better classification. And again, as we've said before, that is just the process of science correcting itself. That's the beautiful thing about science. So on the previous whiteboard, I showed you a figure where the classification scheme matched perfectly well with the phylogenetic groupings. And when it does that, we call those monophyletic groups. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes the phylogenetic groupings do not match the taxonomic, the taxonomic classification. So in this figure here, what we're looking at is a phylogenetic tree shown with the blue and the red, yellow, and blue lines here with the different taxa along the side here. And laid over top of this, we see some taxonomic classification scheme. So this red group here is some classification that taxa B, C, and D have. We don't know what it is because this is just a generic example, but B, C, and D would have whatever this characteristic is. E, F, and G, shown here in yellow, would have a different characteristic, and blue would have yet another characteristic. So on the last slide, we talked about monophyletic groups, and so let's start with that one here. So this is a monophyletic group. And remember, a monophyletic group includes the common ancestor and all the descendants of that common ancestor. So in this case here, if we cut a line, say here, and that includes the common ancestor and all the descendants, as we see here, that is a monophyletic group. Now, up here is a different example, and this is an example of a paraphyletic group. So a paraphyletic group includes the common ancestor, but not all the descendants. Okay, so here, this paraphyletic group includes this common ancestor here, and it includes most of the descendants of that common ancestor, taxes B, C, and D, but not all of them. It does not include A here. So this is a paraphyletic group. This yellow box represents a third group, and it represents a polyphyletic group. And a polyphyletic group does not include the common ancestor of the group. So as we see here in this yellow taxonomic classification, it includes E, F, and G taxa, but it does not include the common ancestor of those organisms or of those taxa. So be familiar with these three different group types and be able to look at a phylogenetic tree, such as this cladogram, and, and determine certain groups are paraphyletic, polyphyletic, or monophyletic. All right, let's go ahead and take a peek at this figure here. This is very similar to what you saw on the previous whiteboard, except this one has names on it. And let's look at these names and then identify if they are paraphyletic, polyphyletic, or monophyletic. So in the different colors, we see the classification scheme laid over top of this phylogenetic tree. So we have this blue classification scheme, which are amphibians. And then we have this green classification scheme, which includes crocodiles. And then in the red one, we see flying tetrapods. We look at the amphibians here, and we look at the common ancestor, which would be here. It includes all of these descendants. It doesn't omit any of the descendants. It includes them all, plus the common ancestor. So this would be an example of a monophyletic group. So let's look at the green group here. And this represents the reptile. And we can see that the phylogenetic tree indicates that turtles, lizards, and snakes, crocodiles, and alligators, and birds should be in this phylogenetic group. However, 
birds are not reptiles. So this includes a common ancestor of the phylogenetic tree, plus most of the descendants, but not all of the descendants, because it does not include birds. So this would be a paraphyletic group, because it includes the common ancestor and some, but not all of the descendants. Now let's look at this red one here. These are the flying tetrapods, and it includes birds and bats. But you can see that it doesn't include a common ancestor. So anything that includes certain taxa, but not a common ancestor, would be polyphyletic. Because it does not include a common ancestor of the two different taxa. So that ends the information for this video podcast. We covered a lot of different new terms and some returning terms, and we started to put them together to understand how to best interpret a phylogenetic tree. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you reach out to me, and if not, I will see you in class. Bye for now.